All right. That's good. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you all. Yeah, Paul, thank you for sharing that. And um, a verse that is on my mind and has been on my mind is uh, Galatians 2.20. And that verse, uh, I can't quote it word for word, but I'll read a little bit. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And that verse has uh, spoke to me a lot in the last, um, probably at least the last month. I was I'm reading a book written by a good friend of mine, a um, gentleman that lives in Florida. And he's just a spiritual uh, mentor and a prayer warrior and just a great guy. And um, he wrote a book, and that's one of the verses that he highlighted in there. And that, that phrase keeps going through my mind. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. The things that, you, that I get to do or the opportunities that I have in this, in this life, um, if, I do, if I do accomplish anything physically, right? If we accomplish anything physically, physically, it's because God gives us the strength to do it. And the life we live in this flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. So it's an opportunity that we have because of Jesus, and we don't have to, uh, we don't have to strive. We have an inheritance, and, and we have a mansion promised waiting for us in, in heaven. Um, so this morning, uh, it's just a privilege for John and I to stand here with you and talk about um, our bike ride, that, the bike ride that we did um, and I guess one of the, maybe one of the questions that maybe you have is how do you spiritualize a bike ride? <laughs> so how do you you know what, how do you know that God is in in those details and that it's part of His plan? And so I think hopefully uh, thank you for your interest. We were asked to share this morning, and we want to do that. Um, and and we but I don't know. I just I've it was a rich experience. The the race across America. Um, that John and I got to experience as riders uh, was a rich experience. And then in the middle of it all, before it even began, really sensed the uh, God in in God in it. God, it was a God mission. And uh, so this is a picture of my family. Uh, I'm just blessed. I'm very blessed to have an amazing wife, Marie, and then our five children. And why would I do something like race across America as a part of a team and take that time? Uh, it took training time and other sacrifices. Um, John can chime in here. Uh, he's going to. But John would say the same thing. Our wives gave us, they blessed us. They gave us the opportunity. Our children supported us. Um, my son Josh here, great encourager. And Michaela, she's same thing. She's very, uh, Michaela's very detailed and great at making good food and she I mean granola and different things like that just ways that our children encourage us and my younger ones same thing they just yeah I remember sitting on the trainer sometimes and they come down and we'd be playing spot it while I was training on the on the trainer just stuff like that um anyway so that's why I put this picture up here because without their support John and I would not have done uh what we did uh, to take on this endeavor but so that's important but then what what is the why behind Zoe International and Race Across America. Um, John, I'll let you talk about that. Go, yeah, please. But yeah, just uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, this morning I feel a little bit lost this morning. My family's at home. All four children are sick this morning, so I feel a little bit lost. They all have fever, and they all have spots in their mouth. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, they're all sick, except my wife and I. So I, I decided to come here, but yeah. Like Merv was saying, thank you to our wives. Uh, Merv and I may look like a little bit of a hero, whatever, paper, p with our pictures on the paper and whatever, what all happened, you know, interviews and stuff like that. But our, the true heroes behind this, I think Merv would say the same thing, are our wives and what they endured through all this, staying at home. Merv and I were away for nine days and all the training we did and come home from work and say, hey, we're going to go for a 30 mile bike ride. And, my wife looks at me and is like, again? I was like, yeah. <laughs> but there are the true heroes. They took care of the children while we were gone, and some of the children were playing ball and uh, schooling and all that good stuff while Merv and I were getting ready for this race. But uh, 
Yeah, the whole thing behind it is uh, for is the obviously Merv and I like biking, but why not do something that you enjoy doing and also have a good cause behind it? And that's what where uh, Zoe International comes in, and their whole thing is about freeing girls and women from sex trafficking, avoiding that whole situation. And I'm thinking there, there's like 49 million uh, girls and boys, women and children. Uh, involved in sex trafficking today. Uh, that's 49 million. They say a quarter of that is children under the age of 10. And uh, I was just doing a little research this morning. They say a lot of these children get taken from different places, wherever it may be, even in the United States, even in our backyard, effort and stuff. Uh, it happens and uh, they get taken and obviously first they get used for some sex and stuff and then uh, their organs, then they, they may kill them, and their organs may be used to, uh, to sell. And, uh, like, for instance, like Botox. You inject Botox in your forehead so you don't create wrinkles, and they want the, gene, the, uh, the genes from these younger children to, to make this Botox so it's a, a lively young cell. And this is children and girls, women and girls that are involved with this. And that's why Merv and I did this to uh, raise awareness for the sex trafficking. And that's what Zoe does. That's where Zoe steps in and uh, frees these girls. But not just frees them, but also is a Christian organization. So they uh, bring the life of Christ in these girls or, or try to. Uh, first they free them and then put them in a safe house. And they, uh, yeah, they bring love and care to them and then eventually bring Jesus into the picture. So, yeah. Yeah, and so we, we uh, I'll go back here a little bit, and I'm just going to show you a few, few pictures. Um, sorry if they, I don't know that, I have an album, but I don't know that they were organized quite in the order. But so before, um, I'm going to go back to when we, when we were getting ready, we got together uh, up in Intercourse, and, and we got our bands ready and the bikes, and there was a lot of prep that goes into it. And we had an amazing team of people um good leaders and guys that have done it before and jake king sitting here this morning he helped with this in 2021 he drove one of the follow cars and it, it just i can't imagine riding in a car driving for 12 hours or more following riders that are going a little slower than the speed like you know 15 20 25 miles an hour average um, and you just, and they have blinkers. The, the bike has to have a blinker on, and the cars have blinkers, and it's just this, like, at, at nighttime sometimes, all night long, just blink, blink, blink for, tw for 12, 13 hours, and you just keep doing it, and, like, bathroom breaks, I mean, maybe, if you get a good opportunity, I get. Like, there's ways to do it, but anyway, so Jake's here, and I just say that because I don't have a picture of the whole team, but for eight guys to bike across the country uh, in a relay race, um, it, it takes some organization, and you don't want to. You don't want to. You want to have a rider riding all the time. You don't want to have downtime where there's nobody pedaling a bike towards the, you know, the destination. And so then we have a crew. We have people that we had two four-man teams. We had two vans like this. Um, John and I and two other guys were in, in one van and then the other four were in the other van. And so each van has its own crew. So you have a mechanic and, a, and you have a driver and that guy, same thing, patience. And like every five miles, you've got to find another place to pull over and it has to meet the ram rules and, and it, it can't be blocking somebody's driveway or some farmer that's picking corn or whatever. They're, you know. So you have to, all these little things along the way and then you... So you put, and so you have a driver and a, a mechanic and a navigator in your van, and then the other van has a driver, mechanic, and navigator. And there's follow car drivers. There's two for day crew and two for, two for night crew. And then there's people getting food and all this stuff going on. And then uh, anyway, so we got together um, the Saturday before, and we got our stuff ready. And then my son Josh was able. He was with us that on that first trial ride, and I just put him up there because. Like I said, he's an incredible encourager to me, especially when I was training in the basement. And he just, thank you, Josh. Love, love your encouragement. You keep it up, buddy. Um, so I put that picture on. Anyway, from there, and we, then we got to, we flew out to California. And this is a picture of the start line is at the, um, the pier where the pier meets the, the, the land there. And then, anyway, this gives you just a little glimpse of what it looks like there. 
Um, we're headed to the start line. Um, and I don't have, I don't think I have any other pictures of us there at our, at the motel, but we were there for two days and I met one of the founders or the, I think he's the, the, the leader of, uh, of Zoe International. Zoe has 200 people on staff and they work, Zoe works in Japan, Thailand, Australia, Mexico, and in the United States. And, and Zoe has a home in Thailand for children, uh, girls and boys that have been rescued. And like John said, they do restorative care. Um, they offer vocational um, teaching, so like schooling and things like that. Um, so, and then there's just show the children the love of Christ. And the, the, I, the, the goal is that these young people that are rescued ha get to experience life as f the life that God created them to experience, that they can be fulfill their purpose on, in this life, you know. Um, so meeting the people involved with Zoe out there, I that, uh, met Dave, um, I, sorry if his last name slips my mind, but great guy him and his family were there and um, he encouraged us the morning of the race and Zoe works with law the legislators in Los Angeles and they work like there's in LA it's um, currently it's there's there's a greater pun, more punishable crime to wrongfully accuse someone than it is to traffic a child in LA so the, the, they're working on, there's legislation right now to change that so that child trafficking is, is a much more punishable crime. Not to just punish the bad guys, so to speak, but that this stuff doesn't just happen so easily and under the, in the shrouds of darkness. Um, even police uh, officers and things like that, they, there's certain laws, there's certain things in place that make, that, that require three detectives and an investigator and another person to be involved just to go in and, and to make, to go into a situation and maybe pull some, some people out that are trafficked. And they, so, so sometimes for the police departments, it's easier for them just to maybe ignore and, you know, or spend their energy doing other things than even getting involved. So Zoe's involved with things like that. And then, like I said, the safe homes that they have in LA, they have a home, there's a hundred children there's over a hundred children there mostly girls but some boys I think and then that have been rescued and the average age is 14 years old and so you think about a young person that's taken against their will maybe against their parents will and this is happening around the world and like John said the numbers are staggering and then you know what what can we do about it you know really think about that what can I do if each one of us says what can I do um, one of the things is is to make awareness and that's why Zoe sponsors a team to ride across America the bike ride gets people's attention it's not to bring attention to us that's not the ultimate mission it's not to us individually it's to bring attention to the cause and the cause is it's a it's the cause of Jesus to rescue God's children are not for sale. They get sold. They, they get shipped in containers across the oceans and into other countries where there's very little law enforcement. These things happen are happening today. So, and the other thing that comes to my mind, awareness. Like, how do we raise awareness? I just, I think for us as dads, first of all, you know, our, our daughters are precious. Their lives are precious. And you know, I know that I have work to do, and I, my, I have three daughters, and they're the oldest one, Michaela's 10, and three and one-year-old, and it's so important, and I, I just, you know, I need God's help. I need that Holy Spirit's help to, to be there for my daughters, that they are not, that they're not vulnerable, um, that, they're, that they know that they're loved, and that their daddy loves them, and that we can point them to God, right? And I think of us as uncles or us as neighbors or us as you know maybe co-workers in speaking into other people's lives I, it, it's important it, it, it's a big deal it matters do you have any thoughts yeah like Merv said I think it really hits home when you think about your own daughter being involved with something like that or your grandchild or whatever it really does hit home because I think the question was asked to me before we did the bike trip like you have a daughter I said yeah and how old is she 
seven, like what would happen if all of a sudden she'd be missing and you have a good idea where she went and like, I, I don't even know how I could get through the day. I mean, yes, you think about losing a loved one or something, it's tough, but if you have a child and you know she's alive and there's a good chance that you know what she's enduring, I, I don't know. I don't even know how I could go to work or, or live my life. It would just be so heart-wrenching and it would just tear families apart. Um, and a lot of times they're never found. Um, so that's uh, where Zoe steps in and tries to help these, these children. But uh, and like Mer was saying with the police officers and uh, law enforcement, it's, it's, it's hard to charge one of these pimps for something that lures these girls in. I mean, the evidence is it's not there. I mean, there's, I mean, yes, they know the girl's doing what they're doing, and, but they can't arrest a girl. And then a lot of times these pimps put so much fear in these girls and these young children that that's the only thing they know is fear. And it's something how women go back to, if somebody just takes advantage of them, they go back to it. I think I, being out in New Horizons for a while too, how these, these women, they just go back to the same men that abuse them and stuff like that. I don't, I don't understand how it works, but they just go back and the fear is just so great. So yeah, all we can do is that we can pray for it and like Merv said, look over our own children and bring awareness to this situation because a lot of times in our culture we're like, we don't think about it that much, you know. Uh, we live in Pennsylvania. We live in Lancaster County. You know, how much of this, of this is really going on in Lancaster County? Um, there's more than you think. There's, there's websites is that you can't touch the websites and black pages or whatever where you can sell children. Some moms sell their own children for money. So, yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, we as men, obviously, again, it's, it's us. We're first. We're responsible first for our families and how, how we view, even how we view women. And just it's, a, it's, it's a very important that we have the love of Christ in us towards, towards others, especially towards girls and children. Um, one of the things that Brad, Brad was here at church a few months ago, and I just one of the, in a, one of the interviews that he did, they asked him, "What is one thing that you would want the general public? If there's one thing the general public would know and understand, what would that be?" And Brad just he said that if there was no vulnerability, there probably wouldn't be any trafficking. So that's if there's no vulnerability, there's probably no trafficking. How can we battle that? How can we combat that vulnerability? What can we do? We can do, we can, we can do something about it, right? And, so, there's a, so. and there's a quote out there, too. I forget who wrote it, but it said, evil preve prevails if good men sit back and do nothing. And I just thought that was a, such a good saying with what we're involved with. You know, us as men, we need to step up and do something, you know, whatever it is, raise funds so we can help situations like this. But, uh, I understand there's so much to, many p different things out there that you can put your money to use to, but uh, yeah, us as good men, we need to step up and do our part. So then, I'll, I, I want to show you some more pictures then. Uh, I know you're probably a little bit interested uh, in, the, in this. This was us at the start line, uh, getting ready to go. We're excited. Uh, we had lots of energy at that point, and uh, that was a challenge throughout the, throughout the race, but there's most of our guys, most of our riders. There's another team there behind us getting ready to, getting ready to start. And you, and you see there, we all have uh, names written on our, our arms there. A lot of you see it. Uh, we were all riding for an indi individual girl or a woman, um, and we heard her story. And obviously the name probably is a fake name or whatever because they to protect her identity. But we all had somebody dedicated that we were riding for. So, and mine was Brenda. I'm not sure who Merv's was either, but you see our name, the names written on our, on our arms there. So then you, we get started. Um, we all rode together for a little bit at the beginning and then uh, for about two miles. Then, then John and Matt, they started the race for about 20 miles and, and they, uh, they, were, they were hustling along. They were putting a lot of effort into it and uh, really got us going. And then we got to... We got to do some climbing and uh, go up over some mountains, and then we got to the top of this. Um, we got to up on top of, we climbed a couple thousand feet from the California seacoast up to uh, 11 mile downhill descents called the glass elevator. And then this is looking down, it, 
this picture doesn't do any kind of justice to it, but John rode down that glass elevator about 11 miles downhill, and he is, there was cars that John had to slow down for. <laughs> he couldn't get around them right away, but. Yeah, like Murph said, this caught the glass elevator because you're up top and you see everything down below, and you just got done climbing, I think the Sierras or whatever, and then it's yeah. downhill to the desert. Uh, yeah. 11 miles of downhill, and uh, before I started, I, I knew there was, people would say that you can't win the race going downhill on the glass elevator, but you can lose the race, so of course that was in my mind. There were some, I don't know, probably 20 plus switchbacks, tight corners and stuff like that, and Matt Lapp wrote it two years ago, and he said, John, he said, if this is extremely dangerous, and this is dangerous, go right in between. And I'm like, <laughs> pretty much saying, ride it as fast as you can, but don't wreck. <laughs> so I think it was like the third corner, I, I misjudged the corner a little bit, went a little bit hard in the corner, and I had to lock the brakes up pretty good. And I think I put a little bit of fear in me there, but uh, I still think I hit like 56, 57 at one point, but uh, I'm not sure what it was. But like towards the end, I was catching up to the cars, and I, I debated if I wanted to past the cars or not, but I didn't, and then kept it safe and mm -hmm. got into Perego Springs safely, and that's where we changed hands with the next team. John, wasn't there something with your t one of your tires at that when you got to the bottom? That they were no, there was not a, that I'm I thought aware there was of. I thought there was something in your one of your tires. Okay, don't think so. We'll let that. One. So then, anyway, then we the next. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saturday, that was Saturday afternoon, and then the other team rode for eight hours, and then we got to ride starting again Sunday night about 1.30, and we rode for about eight more hours and hadn't really slept. We were too excited. It was just so, I mean, the start was, yeah. It, talk about excitement. Like, uh, Mer, the first 20 miles Matt and I rode, and my watts is how much watts you're putting out, how much power you're putting out was way above. I looked at Matt and I said, we need to slow down. I said, yeah, we were putting way too much watts out, but we're going fast, we're passing a lot of teams. But I heard before Merv even did one pedal stroke on the race, before he was ready to get out to do his first turn, I heard his heart rate was 138, 140. And your average heart rate is usually, your resting heart rate is around 70, 80 or something like that. When you're just sitting around, it's a Maybe a hundred, a little excited, you know. <laughs> Mers was at 138 before he ever rode. <laughs> I had goosebumps on my arm. <laughs> so then Sunday, we, like I said, we rode early Sunday morning. And, yeah, Sunday was, uh, we were still excited. We rode across the desert. The other guys had ridden across this California desert into Arizona. And then we rode the end of that. And then Sunday about, I don't know what time this was, 7.30 or 8 o'clock. And I was thinking about yous back here when we were, when we were riding about, um, anyway, so then we got this beautiful sunrise, and we got to this mountain, and we went up over, and we were feeling good. It was, it was just a, it was a great morning. Um, yeah, there's one of the pictures that I wanted to share. For you that don't understand everything, we had, it was an eight-man relay team, a team, and we were split up in two four-man teams, so the one four-man team would ride from, it was supposed to be from midnight to lunchtime, and then the next crew, next four-man team did it from lunchtime to midnight. So we kept rotating to that. Um, yeah. And here's a, here's a picture. So when we, we would ride about five or six miles, and one rider would come in, and the other rider is sitting here ready to go, and you would just, so our wheels would, would meet each other where we were even, and then, then the next rider could go. And during the day, we could do that while we were moving. So the rider going out could be started, started on his – he could start moving ahead when the other rider came in. So you could do that pretty fast if you, if you, if you wanted to. Um, yeah, and there's a picture that we got one of uh, one of the switches. Um, yeah, move on here. We're going to need to keep this going, but – just, I mean, going across the country, I, this, these pictures don't capture near everything. I had some more I thought uh, loaded, but they didn't, they didn't make this. They didn't make this. Uh. So then that was Sunday we rode, and Sunday evening we started riding again. We tried to sleep Sunday during the day for a while, but that was tough. So I think myself and John, we, I don't think we got any sleep from Saturday morning, 5:30. I think until we we went out to the ocean for a cold plunge with the team, uh, and then Saturday morning 5:30. I don't think I slept till about Monday around 10 o'clock in the morning, maybe something like that. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure the first two nights I did not sleep, and that was that was the other hard part. And the, the nights and days were just turned around. I mean, you were waking up at you were waking up at eight o'clock at night, getting ready to go on your ride, and you, and you're eating breakfast and bagels, and you're calling your wife up and saying, "I'm about ready to go out for a ride and have a good day." And the kids are were FaceTiming the kids, just like, "Daddy, we're going to bed." <laughs> So our night and day was just totally turned around. So we got into Bragos, or sorry, we got into Bagosa Springs. So that Sunday night, I want to share this. Uh, we, it was hard. So we were, it, it, we were doing really well going through Monument Valley. I had those couple pictures, Utah into Colorado, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, close to the Grand Canyon. Anyway, we, the elevation, we went up into the mountains. We got up eight, 9,000 feet. And it got cold, and the air's thinner, and we got had a headwind, and it just it got really difficult. That was my hardest moment of the race, and I I was able to keep riding through the night, but I yeah I don't think these guys were sure if I was gonna be able to take my turns, and I just took some shorter turns, and John and the other guys they just kept clipping away, and uh, we got through the night, and we got to. We got to Pagosa Springs. This is what our what it looked like. We get to the bus and shower on a little makeup shower, and then the bus would ride four four or five hours drive ahead to the next transition point. And um, but you know one of the things that happened that day, um, this was that was that picture. That's Monday morning when we got to Pagosa Springs. Um, that's the day Jeff. This is the day our one rider Jeff got hurt um, going across through the mountains. Um, and this was my, like I said, this was my lowest point. So when that day we got some videos and I'll share this one with you. This is one that was for John. I don't, maybe. I'm going to climb out there. You got this, Dad. You can go up on those high mountains. You got this, Dad. You can climb those big mountains. Sorry if I didn't, but. <laughs> Just a little uh, motivation, like halfway through your ride, and you get the clip like that sent to your phone, and you're like, you know, you're going through. You had a hard night. Well, I think that night we rode all night from eight o'clock to eight o'clock, all night long, and like Merv, I think it was that time. I'm not sure. Yeah, Everything was the next together. day. And but then, uh, yeah, I was having, I was struggling too. Like that three o'clock to five o'clock in the morning slug was just, it was rough. You had two turns, and you always, it was cold. So yeah, those were mm -hmm. some of the harder. That was the harder. And this is one, I mean, this is just what encouragement. So those kind of things. And then we got encouragement from others. Uh, Jonathan sent a video and uh, Jake and Suze, you sent a video. And I just, there was so many different things that other riders were and we had a text chat and just the support really really felt the love and the support uh back here and just like i said connecting with zoe's mission out there and knowing what we're riding about so then then when you're riding you you know is it dangerous yeah there's danger they, things can happen obviously one of our riders wrecked jeff before we started you know we prayed for safety and god's protection and i look at that situation you know, someone could say, look what happened. Look at the result. Jeff got hurt. But you know what? Um, that's not the end result. That's part of Jeff's journey, but it's not the end result. I believe God is working very mightily in Jeff's life, and I wanted to um, I have a picture of him. Um, this was an interesting... Oh, boy, that picture didn't make that. So there were seven of us from Lancaster, and we were... They put our pictures on the bus with uh and so we stood there and jeff wasn't on the bus because he lives in colorado so when we took a picture out there at the motel we said oh well let's just hold him so jeff was let, like we were holding him in our arms and uh, then when we took that picture in california then two days later he's laying in the hospital bed and you know we're just like jeff we're riding for you and then he he just he handled it so well. I don't know what that all, why that all, but it was all part of God's plan. And and then um, I'll show you. Uh, this was Jeff after after the accident. Um, now this is a little. He had a, a bone showing in his shoulder uh, through his skin, and his face was really beat up. But 
I mean, I didn't. He didn't complain. He had a great attitude. He just, the way he handled it, really spoke to me a lot. And he's doing well. He's, he's, he's back on his feet, and um, he's hoping to ride this race again, maybe in a couple of years. But it, uh, and then I had another picture of Jeff here. Just, I mean, he's he's healing up, and he's, yeah, he's doing well. Um, and and then another thing that, you know, those low points, some of the encouragement to Jake, Jake would, would send things over and he sent John and I this verse one time. Um, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Habakkuk 319. And that, and that I remember that night there was through Kansas and in, in, in uh, Missouri and Illinois, Indiana, there was a lot of deer at night. We were riding at nighttime and so there would be deer along the road and John had a big buck that I think went right across the road in front of you, right? And, you know, that can something. It was like, an eight point. I'm not even a hunter, but I know it was an eight point. At least. <laughs> and that can, that can either strike fear into you or you can know that it's okay. God is with me. And that night, I was, it was, uh, energy was really good. And I knew that we could just feel the prayers back here and the support. And, and when I saw the first deer that night, I thought about this verse that Jake showed me, and I thought, that's God reminding me. That's not something I need to be afraid of. And that spoke to me a lot. Thank you for sharing that, Jake. And then um, another, yeah, there was people uh, praying, a lot of support. And I'd, I want to, then Jake shared this verse too, and it really meant a lot. Um, Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and proclaim captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. And that, that really stuck with me and it, it just inspired us that, um, yeah. And then one of the guys from Zoe in California, he sent this picture to us. I mean, <laughs> like I said, how do you spiritualize a bike ride? But I, when God is in the details, it, it, it's encouraging. And I think, um, there's eight riders, and out of all of them, I think we're all believers except Jeff. Um, I think some things are changing in his life, too, because mm -hmm. he, he said, God spared me on, on that accident. He said, God spared me for another day. I forget what the text has said, but he's using a lot of spiritual terms in his sayings now, but mm -hmm. as I know, he still hasn't given his life to Christ, so maybe we can be a testimony to him, and just, yeah, I, I want to know him better. And he, he, Jeff believes that God spared him, and he has a plan for his life, and he's very grateful. And he said, he's a miracle that how quickly he's healing, and um, that he just believes it's his, our, the love and support that people have shown him, and, and God's plan for his life. And so, yeah. And then we got, we got to the finish line, and yeah, it was a great moment back with our families. Oh, sorry about that. I did want to show this. I, one thing I failed to mention, after, this was a screenshot, but after Jeff wrecked, it was a Monday. And, you know, I just remember we met the other team there in Colorado. They got through the mountains all right, but it was a hard, difficult moment for them to, to, to ride again. And then Jeff was in care. He was with the ambulance, and he was going to be okay. But just... Getting together on the side of the road with the other group, the other four, the other team. Now there's three of them there, but, and this is what we did. We prayed, you know, and you just, you got, you just give that to God. Give Jeff to God, the situation, the race. It was, it's it never was about being first place. That was, if we got first, finished first, that's great. But we wanted to finish well. And the team just, it bonded us even more in the mission. And yeah, so. It was a it was a it was an amazing experience and just thank you all for for your support in many ways you guys supported us different people and your prayers it means a lot and um yeah this is this verse is for all of us Yeah I too want to just say thank you for every, all the prayers and the thoughts and uh the donations that came towards us uh and yeah and it, like you were saying, Jake, I think every time you send them verses, it's while we were riding, so it was like always a good timing. Um, yeah, I remember them coming through the phone usually. But uh, another like little God moment was like 
I think five days before we were going to fly out to California, I went, or four days, I went to pick up a window, and something flew in my back, and I, could, I was like, I knew it was bad right away. I couldn't even tie my shoes. I was like, oh no, four days before, and I think I put some panic in the team, um, and, so, and I just texted him. I said, hey, I need an emergency uh, chiropractor appointment. I need some prayers, and the next two, next three days, I didn't work, and by the time I was ready to ride my bike out there, it was, everything was fine. So uh, I think God had to play a part in that too because I didn't have trouble with my back for about four years. And all of a sudden, a simple window, you know, 40-pound window or something, boom. I just, I just laid there for a little bit. So, yeah, God was definitely in this all together. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you.